Good morning, Mount Nebo. It's good to see everybody today. Uh, if you please stand and worship with us. you're here with us and uh, we can just feel your presence and uh, let us just surrender to you Lord as we uh, as we are here to li- listen to your name and your word uh, we ask your blessings on us as we uh, hear the message today that we may have uh, open hearts and open minds uh, and we ask your blessings on Mike as well as he gives that message on your name we pray amen <laughs>
oceans deep, faith will stay. to be a part of Children's Church this morning. Just meet Brenda Reed there in the back and she'll direct you out. All right. I want to share a couple of things with you this morning. Uh, first of all, welcome to uh, all of you here gathered in the sanctuary and those who may be listening uh, at our drive-in service in the parking lot and Others who are, will be taking in the service online later on this afternoon welcome you to worship today here at Mount Nebo. I just want to share with you, first of all, that the uh, Wesleyan Covenant Association, uh, which is an, an Orthodox Evangelical organization of like-minded United Methodists, will be holding their annual global gathering in Montgomery, Alabama, at Alabama this Saturday. And uh, though we have some delegates from our congregation that'll be a part of or participating in that, uh, Greg Stover, a retired elder in the United Methodist Church, will be attending as a representative, and also Brenda Reed, our discipleship coordinator, and and uh, and her daughter uh, Elizabeth Reed, pastor of of Malta United Methodist Church. So some folks that we know will be representing uh, there at that global gathering. And uh, I want to let you know there'll be a simulcast of that event, which includes a lot of preaching and some information about 
uh, direction and next steps uh, towards, um, uh, you know, uh, hopefully seeing the protocol for separation passed and, and then uh, us being able to organize together as Evangelical United Methodists. But that simulcast will be offered at Hillsboro United Methodist Church starting at 10 o'clock this Saturday, ending at 4.30, and you're welcome to be a part of that. You're welcome to attend there if you'd like to. Please let me know. There needs to be a registration. Uh, I'll be sure and get you registered, but if you'd like to be a part of that, you are welcome to do so. And we'll be praying for that gathering in just a little bit as well. Uh, one other thing, uh, our leadership team and I met this past week, and uh, we agreed that our congregation should take the next responsible step regarding COVID-19. And, and that step that we've decided on is, is uh, that we will not require, masks will not be required uh, beginning Sunday, May the 9th. But as always, we encourage you to be responsible for yourself and what is best for you. And if it's best for you to continue to wear a mask during worship, we encourage you to do so. Uh, we'll continue to leave the, the seats separated as they are. Uh, but just wanted to let you know that mass will no longer be required as of um, May the Sunday, May the 9th. All right, um, we, uh, let's go to the Lord together now in prayer. And it uh, seems like I'm forgetting something, but I, th I think maybe we're okay. So, so will you pray with me? Oh Lord, we, uh, uh, we know that what your word tells us about you is true that you are good and that your love endures forever. And as we think about, you know, just who we are and, and uh, you know, what you've, what you've done for us through your son, Jesus Christ, we know it's true uh, that you, you're good and your love endures forever. You, you uh, persevere in, in reaching out to us, uh, you know, in inviting us to come into a relationship with you, a right relationship through Jesus, your son. And so you didn't give up on us. Then after we come into that relationship, you're patient with us. Your love endures forever and continues to, uh, you know, strive with us and encourage us to grow in our relationship with you. You're so good to us, Lord, and we just give you uh, our thanks for who you are and what you have done. We do want to pray for Betty Smith, who will be having uh, uh, an ablation surgery on her heart this coming Friday. We ask, Lord, uh, your blessing on her. Also, we pray for Guy Hopkins, who will be having an appointment with a neurologist this Thursday. And then Dan Reed will be having an infusion this coming Wednesday to, uh, uh, to you know, help with an issue he's had with his, his vision. Uh, so for these persons, Lord, we certainly know that you've, you've blessed through, you know, medical, uh, you know, uh, procedures and, and medicines and so forth to help. But beyond that, Lord, we pray that you would intercede for them. And uh, Lord, that you would uh, bring healing to them and blessing to them as they wait upon you and we wait upon you with them. We do also want to pray for um, Emily Baker, Cass and Lisa Kramer's granddaughter who is missing. Lord, we pray that she would be found and found safe. Uh, Lord, will you, um, you know, bring that about, we, we pray, and comfort Cass and Lisa and others as, as they uh, trust in you. We also want to pray for um, Alyssa Eubanks and the uh, middle school group, the 456 group, as they go to the Villa Georgetown Nursing Home this Monday to minister to the residents there. Uh, we, we pray that Jesus might be seen in, in, th in and through their lives to bless the residents. And for the delegates of the WCA, uh, all of them, we pray your hand upon them, that you're, you would guide them in the good and right paths for uh, the future of the Wesleyan Covenant Association, but, but also the, the global, uh, uh, United, uh, global Methodist Church. And, and so, Father, bless each delegate. May they sense your spirit carrying them to the decisions that would be best to be made for your name and for your kingdom. Father, we also want to pray for the reading of, of your word that we'll get to share in in just a few minutes. As always, Lord, may you find us approaching it with the right kind of heart that we might hear you speak even to our lives. We pray it in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
This is the uh, last sermon in the series, Come Alive, and of course we're speaking about coming alive to, to God, and, uh, and so, you know, today I just want to say that come al- coming alive to God involves figuring out trusted love, figuring out what it is and what we do with it. So it involves that, coming alive to God involves that. I think the world around us is constantly trying to figure it out. Uh, every generation seems to, you know, reconsider the whole idea of, of love. And I think the whole world in general, uh, the reason that is is because I think the whole world in general questions whether, uh, you know, this kind of, of love, trusted love, is, is even such a, a thing. Does it even exist? You know, people everywhere, I think, want to know, is, is there such a thing of the, is that kind of love? Can there be such a thing as that kind of love, which which even extends to people, you know, other people groups that we're not as familiar with, people who are not similar to us. Can, can that kind of love, trusted love, extend to, to even different people groups? Can that kind of love extend to different political factions, folks that are not like-minded with wherever we are? Can it extend to other nations who who uh, maybe aren't, aren't on the same page as we are. Can that kind of trusted love exp- extend to people that we like and also extend to people that we don't like and don't care as much for? Is, is there such a thing as trusted love that, like that? I think not only the world, but I think the church keeps trying to understand the trusted love of God too. I mean, Scripture tells us about it, right? We read about it. We're going to read more about it today, but but not, what does it look like in our lives, and, and how do we work it out? I think most people want to know about that. By the way, what is love? What is it? What would be your definition? I, I, I know that some of our ideas about what love is have, have come and continue to come from music. For example, here are some of the, according to this website, My Wedding Songs, some of the greatest love songs uh, of all decades. And so I want to begin with the 1950s. Uh, Supposedly, uh, the song Earth Angel is one of those love songs. You remember who, who, uh, uh, you know, was the group that popularized that song? They were called the Penguins. I didn't remember that part. I'd heard the the song title. Earth Angel, 1954, it came out. That's, uh, by the way... For those of you that don't know, that was part of the doo-wop music. So if you don't know what that is, look that up on, online. But Earth Angel was one. 1958, another one was uh, by, Teddy, by the Teddy Bears. And the title of the song was, To Know Him Is to Love Him. And then 1959, I Only Have Eyes for You by the Flamingos. Uh, more love songs. This, these from the 1960s. First of all, 1965. I Can't Help Myself by the Four Tops. Um, you know, the, the most well-known lyrics from that song are these. Sugar pie honey bunch, you know that I love you. I can't help myself. I love you and nobody else. You, you remember how it goes? Have you heard that? Sing it with me. Sugar pie honey bunch, you know that I love you. I just can't help myself. I love you and nobody else. Don't, 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 don't. Yeah, some of you were kind of getting into it, right? You know, you know that song. Uh, the, uh, uh, I want you to, guys, if you're with that special someone in your life, I want you to lean over to her and say, Sugar pie, honey bunch, you know that I love you. Will you say that? Come on, guys. Sugar pie, honey bunch, you know that I love you. There you go. <laughs> Who talks like that anymore? Nobody does, right? Nobody talks like that. But I have a feeling throughout the course of the day, those words will probably be, be voiced by some of you. Well, that was uh, 1965. 1966, another love song came out. It was real popular called When a Man Loves a Woman by Percy Sledge. And then 1967, Can't Take My Eyes Off of You by Frankie Valli. Then jump ahead to the 70s. One of the songs I was surprised to see was considered a love song 
was Bridge Over Troubled Water by Simon and Garfunkel. And then 1970 also, I'll Be There by the Jackson Five. You probably remember that one. 1973, You Are the Sunshine of My Life by Stevie Wonder. Then jump ahead to the 90s, 1992, I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. You might remember this is the title song from the movie The Bodyguard with Kevin Costner. And, and so uh, and then 1997, the song From This Moment On by Shania Twain. Then in the 2000s, 2002, the song was released A Moment Like, Lit, like This by Kelly Clarkson. And then 2004, Making Memories of Us by Keith Urban. And, and what about some of the lo- love songs of this decade? Maybe I'm not familiar with them so much. I mean, the 2000s and, and uh, you know, starting, or 2000, yeah, 2000s, no, 2010s. And then, t- what, what year is it? Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> by the way, on that list, I saw a song that was included, a love song by Bruno Mars, but I can't remember the title of it, wasn't familiar with it. But anyhow, my, my point is love songs share ideas about what love is. And some of them, you know, may seem that, that they have a handle on, on real love or trusted love, but whether they do or not, our ideas about love have been influenced some by music, haven't they? Our ideas about love have also been influenced by uh, movies that have come out over the years. And according to the website Empire Online, uh, here are some of the best romantic movies of all time. Uh, Number one on their list was When Harry Met Sally, the 1989 release, Billy Crystal, Meg Ryan. The number two, this may be one you were expecting to see, Casablanca. 1942 by Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. Uh, Number five, they had listed The Princess Bride, came out in 1987. Uh, One that was on that list somewhere was Sleepless in Seattle. You may remember that, Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan. Number 20, you're probably waiting on this one, one of the top uh, movies, uh, romantic movies of all time, Gone with the Wind, released in 1939. Clark Gable, Vivian Lee. And by the way, uh, way on down the list was my favorite romantic comedy, Joe Versus the Volcano. Have you ever seen that? You want a good laugh, just take a look at at that one. Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan, Abe Vigoda, if you know who Abe Vigoda is, he's he's a nut anyway. So uh, Joe Versus the Volcano, but, uh, and I don't know much about current romantic movies, but the point is, not only music, but movies have influenced our ideas about love. Now, when it comes to Scripture and the writings uh, of the apostles, the apostle John wrote a lot about real, godlike love, real, trusted love. And so let's look at that, uh, what uh, John had to say in uh, 1 John chapter 3 verses 16 to 18. Will you follow along, please? This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So back to that earlier question, what is love? Uh, The Apostle John wrote that we can know what it is. We can know what love is and simply put that Jesus laid down his life for us. That's what love is. And again, I think people want to know what it is. People want to experience it. We want to know. We want to experience it. I think deep down everyone wants to know what love is. So exactly what is it? I, uh, I ask this question of couples who come to me for premarital counseling. I'll ask them, what is your definition of love? And give them a chance to share that with me. And, and they, they tell me what they, they think it is. And, and, and I can tell that most of them really want to get the right answer. They really want to comprehend and understand it well. And, and in so many words, they, they let me know that they want to be sure that they know what real love is because they, they want, it, they want to, to make their love last. 
They, they, want, it to, they want to understand it. They want to live it out. They, they want to know. In his video series, Toward a Growing Marriage, Dr. Gary Chapman, that some of you have heard of or maybe even seen that video series here, he says that engaged persons often ask their parents what love is. And because their, their parents often struggle to understand it and define it themselves, Dr. Chapman says that the parents sometimes def- say this in response to that question, to ask of, of, of their children when they say, hey, what, what, is, you know, what is love? And the parents will often say, well, if it's real, you'll know it. They, they struggle to define it. I think he's right. These parents, he said, mean well, but that isn't very helpful. That kind of definition of what love is isn't very helpful. Romantic love is, is often spoken of as something that people fall into. You hear it all the time. I heard it just yesterday in something I was watching. You know, they, they, fell, they fell in love. And I don't think that's a very helpful way to describe uh, you know, real trusted love either because I don't know about you, but in my experience, most things I ever fell into weren't good. You know, you, you know just, just not a very good description. But the point is people know, uh, want to know what trusted love is. And so the question comes up naturally, what is love? And not just romantic love, but the trusted kind of love that's at the core of all genuine kinds of love. Not just romantic love, but you know, the love of family and the love of friends. And you know, you know, that, that kind of uh, you know, the real trusted love is, is at the core of all kinds of love. Here's what God led the Apostle John to write again in verse 16 about what love is. This is is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. The first part of what this verse tells us is that God didn't leave us wondering about love. He didn't leave us wondering about what it is. He showed us. He showed us, didn't he? Uh, it isn't primarily something we feel or say, those, though we, we do those things. We do feel and say love at certain times. Love isn't primarily, though, something we feel and say. Love is evidenced in what God did, right? It's, it was shown, it was proven in what God did. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us. That's what He did. And John wanted to make sure that none of us miss it. So he, again, he repeats it in chapter 4, verse 9, when he said this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. In other words, God did something to show his love for us. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and lived among us, uh, people that he created. Think about that. God put on a human body, came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, and He lived among the people He created. He lived among us. And, and he, he taught us about his, his Father and His kingdom. And, and He cared for the sick. Jesus went to the untouchables of His time, the lepers, and touched them and, and healed them. He loved people. Therefore, Jesus did something. And by the way, He he, uh, in, not just with the lepers, and anytime we see uh, you know, information about Jesus interacting with lepers, but it's often seen in other healings and so forth that Jesus did. It wasn't just the physical healing that was a part of it. It was the restoration to relationship, the pulling people out of isolation that either their sin had caused or their condition had caused or whatever it was, whatever it was had separated from people. When he healed them, he restored them into right relationships with one another, with him and with one another. That kind of reminded me of how how significant and, and how, you know, challenging, how harmful isolation is and we just came through a period of that didn't we to some extent we were all isolated and and so you know that that's how how significant that isolation is and Jesus constantly did something about it because he loved people he gave broken people a second chance think about the woman at the well 
you know, she, she was there in the middle of the day, and you've probably heard about this before. If she was, was you know, in, in you know, good standing with the, felt, the, the ladies of her own village, she would have been there in the morning in the cool of the day with all the other women. But she wasn't. She came alone in the heat of the day because she wasn't accepted very well with those, you know, among those women because she had had five husbands and she was living with another one at that time. So there she was, and Jesus gave her a second chance and encouraged her to believe in him. that She could have a different life. And then think about Zacchaeus, that greedy, cold-hearted tax collector. I mean, there he was. I mean, he isolated himself from other people because of, because of his sin. And, and Jesus reached out to him, didn't he, and gave him a second chance. And he believed in Jesus and and then reconciled with other people that he had stolen from and offended and so forth. Jesus loved people, the point is. Therefore, he did something. Ultimately, Jesus loved people and therefore he uh, allowed himself to be crucified on a cross. Jesus loved people. Again, therefore, he did something. Trusted love does something. God sent Jesus That's what God did when we were in need. When the world was in need of forgiveness, when sin had the upper hand, and and everybody's affected by it, God did something. He sent Jesus. He came in the person of Jesus Christ. He could have done anything to, to remedy it. He could have just thrown money, wealth at us. God owns everything, right? He could have just thrown wealth at the the problems, the needs that people had because of sin. But he he didn't do that. I mean, you think about it. uh, Maybe you're thinking, well, I wouldn't mind if God threw a bunch of wealth my way. But money isn't what people need most, and we know it's not what we need most, right? Real trusted love is what people need most, and, and it's what we need most, as I said. So let me illustrate that. Imagine having a family member or a good friend who's a resident at a nursing home. And, you know, being there partially is a loss of independence uh, that, that's difficult for them to deal with. Or how about just the isolation we were talking about that's, you know, difficult for them to deal with. They have a need. They're, they're hurting, aren't they? Now imagine that you decide that you're going to do something about it and what, what they need most, you think, is money. And so you know, we think money will make things better for them. So you send them a card with a $50 bill in it. Now, is that what they need? Of course not. What they need to know and experience is that someone loves them. They need you. They need you to give yourself and go to them. They need your love more than anything else that, that you know, that someone on earth can, can give them. And it's true that that's why Jesus Christ came to earth. Because God loved people, therefore he did something. And Jesus came because he loved people, and therefore he did something. He gave his life to save us. That's real love, and that's what we need most. And John went on to write the second part of verse 16. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now think about it. Deep down, everybody needs and wants Jesus-like trusted love. But that kind of love isn't common. I mean, we can count on it from the Lord Jesus, but, but trusted Jesus-like love isn't always experienced from other people. So, should we just wait? Just kind of back off and wait and hope to be the recipients of genuine love and figuring that if we're shown that kind of love then we will in turn love them back jesus like love doesn't wait he loves us and therefore he did something to make the way for us to be saved from our sins even before we cared about him listen to romans chapter 5 verse 8 but god demonstrates his own love for us in this While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, when we were not very lovable. In other words, when we were covered with the the guilt of our sin, Jesus loved us anyway. When we didn't care about loving him back, 
Jesus loved us. And, 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 and you know, speaking to, to you here who are believers in Jesus Christ, He wants us to love people with that kind of love. He wants us to, He wants other people to experience his kind of love through us. Jesus wants people to figure out what, what, kind of, what His kind of love is like through, uh, through what we do to love them. From uh, 19, 1985, I should say, through 1990, I attended Columbia Bible College in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, my wife, Elise, and our uh, son Michael, who was a year old at the time, moved there in January of 1985. Our other two boys were born while we were living there in South Carolina. Um, while I was attending college, work was also important, you know, with the family especially, you know, to provide for them. And it was just wonderful to see how God provided uh, work for me while I was there, work that was suited for a married student. Um, it came about one day, was eating in the common area after between classes at noon, brought my lunch, and there was a couple other married students there, and, and they, they started to ask about me, and I was asking about them, and long story short, they turned out to be two students who owned a window cleaning company that cleaned windows in the Columbia, South Carolina area all year long, and they were looking for an employee. And it just works out perfect because I could take a, a, uh, a route of window cleaning in a certain area of the city and, and work that around my school schedule. And so if, it, if I had mornings free, I could run that route in the morning. If I had afternoons, I could run it in the afternoon. If I had a day, whatever it was, it just worked out great. And uh, uh, God provided for us wonderfully through, through, uh, through that, that company. Now, I wanna, want you to kind of get to know a guy named Norm Przbilski. Now, Norm was also a, a fellow student, and uh, he was living in the same marriage student, marriage student housing area as the rest of us. And uh, uh, he was involved in a ministry with men who were, had been recently released from prison. And uh, Norm was, just, was doing his best to love these guys with a Jesus-like love. So besides meeting with them and teaching them scripture, um, he tried to help them find jobs. It was kind of hard to do, find a job, you know, as, uh, you know, as a, a felon, and, and, you know, how do you, how do you get employment when, when you've got that kind of a, a record? But he was trying to help them find jobs, and so often I knew that he talked with the two owners of that company that I worked for, those other students, and uh, he would say, uh, say to them, you know, do you guys have any work now for, for one of these men? Do you have anything for one of these, one of these guys? And, uh, you know, though, though it wasn't my decision, um, you know, whether or not they hired somebody, uh, honestly, I didn't like the idea. I, I didn't like the idea. I mean, I, all I could think about was myself and the hassle that it was going to be, you know, how, how much of it. Uh, you know, I kind of looked at it as maybe being babysitting or what else, you know, and, and hey, we were, we were all just running 100 miles an hour between family and, and job and school and, you know, just going like crazy. And I'm thinking, oh, man, what a hassle. I don't have time for that. We're just trying to survive here and get through Bible college so that we can, we can start doing ministry once we're done with Bible college. You see that? faultiness of that thinking you know my thought was oh, I just get through and I wasn't looking at the opportunities for ministry that God would put right before me even at that time but if I was going to be any part of that or be a willing part of that kind of thing I was going to have to love these guys that I never knew that I didn't know yet I was going to have to love them with a Jesus like love and give myself and my time and, you know, an uh, open heart, a caring heart uh, for, for them. And, but my thinking was, you know what, let's just get through this, these college years and, and then, we'll, uh, then we'll start, then I'll start doing ministry. But, uh, uh, you know, as I thought about it later on, that wasn't Norm's, that wasn't Norm's attitude 
Because Norm didn't take no easily. Every few months, he'd be talking to the owners of that company. He'd say, do you have anything yet for one of, one of these guys that I'm, that I'm working with? He didn't take no easily because he was choosing to love these guys with a Jesus-like love. He saw the need, therefore he did something. He didn't just talk about it. He didn't just encourage them. Oh, hang in there, guys. He didn't do that. Uh, just do that. He loved them. He did something because he loved them. Now, do you remember that song by the Four, four Tops? You remember that song we talked about at the beginning there? You, know, you remember the, the, how, how the most popular line of that song went? Sugar pie, honey bunch. Don't forget that now. You need to talk to Chris. Tell that to Chris today. Will you, Julie? Tell him. And Jim, too, Janice. You, you let him know that. You learned that at church. Sugar pie, honey bunch. You tell him that. Sugar pie, honey bunch. You know that I love you. I just can't help myself. What? I just can't help myself. I mean, that, that implies that love just happens. It implies that love isn't a choice to do something. And that's wrong. That idea about love is absolutely wrong. The Apostle John wrote that Jesus, like love, chooses to lay down our lives for the sake of persons in need. And it doesn't just happen. Uh, you know, John went on to, went on to say, listen, have pity on, on persons in need of love. Not, not just words. Don't just say that you love them. Don't love them in, in words only. Don't just... You know, but, but love them in action and truth. You know, chances are you're aware of, of someone's need right now. You know, maybe it's someone in your own family, someone in your neighborhood, somebody you work with, somebody in the community that you run into on a regular basis. Chances are you're aware of someone's need right now. So what will you do? You know, John says, love people with a Jesus-like love. What will you do? I mean, will, will you just think, hey, you know, will you think along these lines, oh, somebody else will do something. I can't right now. Or, or will you think, you know what, later on when whatever it is happens, uh, and, and I'll, I'll be ready then to, to really get involved and love people with a Jesus-like love. Maybe you're thinking, well, I'll send them a text today or I'll send them a card. You know, there's somebody in need and I'll just, I'll share some words with them. Hey, that's great. But I hope that's not all that you're going to do. Because Jesus-like love does something. Jesus-like love chooses to, to do something, to, to lay down our lives, so to speak, uh, to, to act now, to do something. So how will you lay down your life for someone else this week? That's the, the Jesus-like trusted love that John is speaking about. So what will you do? And what will you do this week? Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, um, always, you know, there's this always need around us and certainly you don't expect any one person to meet all of those needs that's true but Lord Jesus you don't expect us just to overlook every one of them either so what need around us do you want us to, to greet with Jesus like love what need around us do you want us to do something about to love people like you loved us through Jesus, your Son? God, help us to see it. Give us hearts that will choose to love them with your kind of love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand, please? That the highest king would welcome me. I 
I was lost, but he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, is free in our uh, district, the Shawnee Valley District of the United Methodist Church is just getting underway. And this, this ministry was more or less something like uh, Norm was trying to do. And it's a uh, ministry that uh, greets uh, men after they are released from prison, men that don't have a supportive family, men that don't have anybody to help them on the you know, a new start. They're, they're, they're men that have, you know, the chaplain has been working with and they're known and that sort of thing. They're, they're men that have been identified as, as needing help to get started. And uh, uh, so that's starting up. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, people from this congregation, men from this congregation, who uh, would, would want to be a part of that with me. It, it involves uh, meeting them after they're released and just providing some supplies for them and just kind of starting to build a relationship. If you'd like to be a part of that, let me know, okay? Hey, you know, what is it that, uh, you know, Jesus did? He, we know what love is because he laid down his life for us. And so who is it that you know that's in need? Who is it that you know that needs you? to lay down your life, so to speak, to love them with a Jesus kind of love. Hey, do that this week with his help, and have a great week.